So good evening, everyone. I'm Dwayne Gordon, CEO of Community Shares of Greater Cincinnati, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural session of the Margaret Fuller Lecture Series. In this series of talks, Community Shares aims to help initiate community discussions on several difficult topics within our core mission areas, social and economic justice, environmental sustainability, and animal welfare. Community Shares is our region's federation of charities working in these fields. We partner with more than 30 local organizations furthering a more just, equitable, and environmentally healthy greater Cincinnati region. We assist our member organizations with capacity building training, collaboration, advocacy, and fundraising via workplace-based campaigns. More information, including how to donate for individual charities, is available on our website at cintishares.org. Our lecture series is named in honor of Community Shares donor, Margaret Peggy Ruder Fuller, who passed in 2014. She was a passionate social justice activist on a local, regional, national, and international level during her 94 years, from <clears throat> co-founding the Unitarian Fellowship in her hometown of Hamilton in Butler County, and organizing protests against the Vietnam War in Washington, to working on civil rights nationwide and leading two international peace promotional tours to the Soviet Union. Community Shares of Greater Cincinnati was one of her favorite charities she promoted during her lifetime. And when she died, she remembered us in her will with a sizable estate gift to support our continuing work in the community. We are privileged to extend her legacy and appreciate her support. Our first installment in the series, The Cincy Rainbow, shines a light tonight on the city's LGBTQIA community, struggles we have faced in the past, our current level of tolerance here in Cincinnati, and the fights that continue toward full inclusion and acceptance. We are pleased to co-present this session with one of our member organizations, the Equality Ohio Education Fund, which advocates and educates on behalf of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning Ohioans to achieve legal and lived equality. Additional Margaret Fuller lecture sessions will follow quarterly. Our next installment scheduled for January will focus on DEI at major corporations in the Cincinnati region. We hope you'll join us again at that time. Our format tonight will feature first a round robin with our panelists, each of whom will be asked one or two direct questions by our moderator. After each has answered their round of questions, we will enter into a group discussion about the LGBTQIA community in Cincinnati. Attendees are invited to suggest questions using the Q&A button on your Zoom controls at the bottom. As time allows, we will utilize some of your questions in the group discussion. We're pleased to welcome tonight's moderator, Local 12 co-anchor Kyle Linsky. Kyle joined the Local 12 news team in June 2018, and he anchors the 5, 6, and 11 p.m. newscasts with Paul Latati. Prior to moving to Cincinnati, Kyle worked as a morning reporter, fill-in anchor for Fox 59 in Indianapolis, where he covered, among other top stories, the 2017 presidential inauguration, 100th running of the Indy 500, and the sentencing of former subway pitchman Jared Fogle. During his first year out of college, Kyle worked for NBC News in Washington and was selected as the Tim Russert Fellow for 2012. As part of that program, he researched for the network's political unit, assisted correspondents and field producers, and worked alongside the Meet the Press digital team. He is a magna cum laude graduate of Butler University with a degree in electronic journalism. Please welcome Kyle. Thank you so much, Duane, and thank you to everyone for being here tonight. It is an honor uh, and a privilege to be amongst this incredible group on a Monday night. I wish every Monday uh, could start with all of you beautiful people in my life, especially on a Monday when we spend so much of the day worrying when Facebook and Instagram uh, and all of our favorite social media platforms were going to come back online. Um, so I'm going to start tonight by introducing all of our incredible panelists. Um, and bear with me because they all have quite wonderful resumes. So we're gonna run through uh, the highlights of them. We're gonna start with Mr. Jim Obergefell, who is the name plant, plant, excuse me, plaintiff from the landmark United States Supreme Court marriage equality case, Obergefell v. Hodges, following that 2015 decision, 
Jim embraced a new career as an LGBTQ plus activist. He is the director of special events currently with Family Equality and the author of Love Wins. Next, we have Alfonso Gerhard Steen, who is a partner in a civil rights firm of Friedman, Gilbert, and Gerhard Steen, litigating civil rights issues for more than 40 years, including serving as lead counsel in Obergefell v. Hodges and the case that resulted in Cincinnati's collaborative agreement, agreement, a national model for police misconduct reform. He's also a founder of the Ohio Justice and Policy Center. Next, we have Ron Clemens, who is a retired social worker and educator, but who is now enjoying a second act as a professional photographer. He's been involved in many of the region's LGBTQIA organizations and is currently associated with Cincinnati Black Pride, Cincinnati's Men Chorus, and Buckeye Flame, among others. Joshua Case works at PACOR as an implementation consultant, but has long been uh, a worker on the front lines at several queer related local organizations in his time as an LGBTQ plus advocacy and also a disability rights advocate. Reverend David Meredith is the lead pastor at Clifton United Methodist Church. His ordination has been contested and threatened due to his sexuality and his marriage to his partner of 34 years. He has worked for LGBTQ justice within the Methodist Church since back in 1981. Ryan Messer is a region business director with Johnson & Johnson and serves as vice president of the Cincinnati School Board. He helped establish the Cincinnati chapter of the Human Rights Campaign, and he and his husband have four children. Tristan Vaught is an independent consultant and professor of queer and trans studies at the University of Cincinnati. They co-founded Transform Cincy to provide new wardrobes to transitioning teens and young adults in our region. And last, but certainly not least this evening, we have Ms. Sarah Vance Waddle, who is joining us. And she is a community advocate, philanthropist, and art collector who has amassed one of the largest collections of women's art in the Midwest. She is also the owner and president of SMV Media and lives with her wife and two of her children. So today, Cincinnati is regarded as one of America's progressive and inclusive cities. We've elected several openly queer people to public positions. Our prides are among the largest community events each and every year. The Human Rights Campaign's Municipal Equality Index gives us a score of 100, one of just 94 cities in the entire United States to earn that recognition. But it wasn't always like that. Looking back just 30 years ago, right, not even that long ago, uh, against a powder keg of racial brutality, Cincinnati exploded. Police killings of Black men had occurred again and again. And when a team named Timothy Thomas was killed in 2001, the city erupted in an uprising. Against the backdrop, the city's LGBTQ community had been pushing city council for a human rights ordinance that protected residents from discrimination based on sexual orientation, something successfully achieved in 2002. But voters soon rescinded that protection by an almost two thirds majority referendum vote. Constitutional challenges led by Mr. Al Gerhardstein failed in court. Economic boycotts by various groups resulted as protests against the city's treatment of both its LGBTQ population and its African-American population. The Contemporary Arts Center director was charged with obscenity over sexually explicit images in a Robert Maplethorpe exhibit. Cincinnati was carving out a reputation in the national press as America's most anti-gay cities and one of its most unsafe for black residents. Change was a long time coming. The collaborative agreement reformed law enforcement and addressed racial bias in policing starting in 2002. And then in 2006, LGBTQ protections were once again established in a city ordinance. Over the past two years, it has sometimes felt that we were back in the 2000s again. Much has changed, but many old prejudices remain. Tonight, we're gonna to examine some of the progress made and the road that lies ahead yet still to be traveled. We begin with Jim Obergefell and Al Gerhardstein. And so Jim, I wanna start specifically with you because your name will forever be etched uh, in the history books as that case that brought marriage equality to all LGBTQ couples in America. And yes, it was a story, um, as we all know, of both triumph and tragedy as you were suing to be recognized 
um, as a spouse on your terminally ill husband's death certificate. So can you share how your experience here in Cincinnati with John Arthur uh, was prior to marriage and why you decided that it was time for you to fight for those rights? Thanks, Kyle. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight. What a great group of panelists. So, you know, when John and I got together, it was 92 going into 93. And I had come out in the summer of 92. And, you know, up to that point, Cincinnati, for me, when I moved there in 84, certainly was not a welcoming city for the gay community, even though I was firmly closeted. But for John and I, when we became a couple, I have to say, you know, we never experienced direct discrimination, at least not that I recall. And we were always open. We worked together at the same company several times. Our coworkers, our bosses, everyone knew we were a couple. But here we were in Cincinnati, you know, the city that was unfortunately well known as not a very welcoming place. And from early on in our relationship, we talked marriage, but we agreed, John and I both discussed this and we agreed that for us, marriage couldn't just be something symbolic. It would have to be something that carried legal weight. So we just figured we would never have that opportunity. We would never be able to marry. And we just built our life together here in, in Cincinnati. And we surrounded ourselves with family and friends who loved us and treated us just like any other couple that they knew. And like I say, we were lucky. We, ne we never really experienced discrimination. Now, marriage, it finally became an option for us in 2013 when the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act with their decision in the United States versus Windsor. And we hadn't talked about this. We hadn't planned on this, but I spontaneously proposed to John. And at, the, at that time, he was bedridden and dying of ALS. So we ended up getting married in Maryland and we got back to Cincinnati. And honestly, Kyle, all we wanted to do was get married. We just wanted to live out John's remaining days as husband and husband. We had no plans to do anything else. But a friend, a neighbor of ours in North Avondale was writing for the Cincinnati Inquirer. And she asked if, she, if we would be willing to have her write a story about our trip to Maryland to get married. And we said, sure. So. We got married on a Thursday. That story came out online on Saturday. And then other friends from North Avondale were at a party where they ran into Al Gerhardstein. And our story came up in conversation. Well, through those mutual friends, we were introduced to Al. And honestly, all it took was Al coming to our home and pulling out a blank Ohio death certificate and pointing out that when John died, his last official record would be wrong because Ohio would ignore our lawful Maryland marriage, pretend it didn't exist. And when they filled out his death certificate, it would say he was unmarried and my name would not be listed as his surviving spouse. We never in our wildest dreams thought about suing the state of Ohio and the city of Cincinnati. It wasn't something we had ever dreamt of, but here we were learning that our marriage, which we knew Ohio wouldn't recognize, but that was abstract. Al made that abstract knowledge real with that death certificate. And when he asked if we wanted to do something about it, we discussed it and said, yeah, we do. We, we want to fight this because our marriage deserve to be recognized and respected. So, you know, we sued Ohio and the city of Cincinnati. And I'll add one last little thing before I wrap up, just to illustrate how drastically the city of Cincinnati had changed in the... 30 years I'd been there at that point. In court for our very first hearing, the city solicitor stood up in the courtroom and, and addressed the judge and said, your honor, the city of Cincinnati agrees that John and Jim's marriage deserves to be recognized. We want nothing to do with this lawsuit. So for me and John, this was this beautiful instance of the change in Cincinnati becoming real in a very public, very strong, very wonderful way in a courtroom saying, Cincinnati has changed and we think their marriage deserves to be recognized. And I'm curious, what does it mean to you to be one of the many, but one of the most public faces of marriage equality in this country? You know, Kyle, it's been overwhelming to say the least, you know, having never expected to file a lawsuit like this, let alone have my name and face become, you know, 
well, the named plaintiff, the name of the case, I honestly felt guilty because John's and my story was one of many stories. There were more than 30 plaintiffs in, in this consolidated case and stories that were equally as compelling as ours. You know, there was another widower, there were children. The, the youngest plaintiff in the case was a two-year-old boy named Cooper who was adopted in Ohio. So I felt guilty on that very small level of with the other plaintiffs in our case. But honestly, beyond that, if, as far as across Ohio and across the United States, when it really sunk in that this was happening and it was be going to the Supreme Court, it turned into this wonderful thing where people would stop me on the street, in airplanes, wherever I went, just to, to thank me, to hug me, to shake my hand, share, me, share photos with me. And it just became this wonderful thing where I was, I was being thanked and people were sharing things with me everywhere I went. And it, it just made anything that I went through, any, any stress, any struggles, um, any of the challenges that go with a, being in a Supreme Court case made it all worthwhile because I could see one-on-one -on -one the, the change that this case had the potential to make. And after, after we won, the change that it did make, especially for young people. You know, so for me, that, that was always the most amazing thing, just that people would, would come up to me, share stories. And I've had quite a few young people come out to me for the, the first time they've ever come out has been to me. So what a wonderful gift that has been. Incredible, incredible. I remember I was working in Indianapolis at the time, but when I moved here, and I remember the first time that I realized that you and your husband were both living here in Cincinnati, I stopped and I looked at my co-anchor and I was like, hold on, this was in Cincinnati? It was just a, a moment for me. You know, it's just so incredible that you guys are here in Cincinnati and with Al. And I think that's the perfect segue um, to go to Al because Al, you have said that your battle plan for Jim's court challenge was based on the case of U.S. versus Windsor, where the Supreme Court struck down part of the discrimina discriminatory defense of marriage act. So could you describe what was that legal basis for this case um, and your argument here? Uh, sure. Windsor said that the federal government had to recognize marriages from those states where marriages were legal. And the federal government had always done that. And yet Ohio was picking and choosing. When, and that's, that was the legal theory that we chose to use for Jim and John. If you were a young kid and couldn't get married because you were under 16 in Ohio, but you went off to Georgia and got married uh, and came back as a married person, your marriage would be recognized. If you were a first cousin, you couldn't get married in Ohio, but you go off to Massachusetts where you're allowed to marry a first cousin, come back to Ohio, your marriage would be recognized. So we sued saying, wait a minute, Ohio, under the Equal Protection Clause, you got to treat these same-sex marriages the same as you would the first cousin or the young person. And that was one of several theories that we used to try and say, the marriage recognition and ultimately the right to marry should go forward. And it was very exciting when we won and Jim and John got the uh, death certificate correctly noted when uh, John sadly passed. Uh, but it was, uh, it was very uh, fulfilling uh, because that was John's dying wish. And that was a big deal. You describe it as exciting, but I'm wondering, what is that feeling when you see the decision come down, right? Are you nervous beforehand? Walk us through what's going through your brain during that time. Well, you don't know for sure how it's all going to turn out, obviously. And uh, my track record on gay rights cases was terrible prior to that. I lost every gay rights case I filed. And I had been filing gay rights cases since the 80s. I represented ministers who got thrown out of their denominations. I represented employees who were, who were denied uh, their jobs. I represented the people of Cincinnati, uh, the gay people in Cincinnati who opposed Article 12. And I lost every one of those cases because we were struggling to build the law upon which gay rights could stand strong. And so, of course, you hold your breath and you hope that this time it'll work. 
and it was just totally exciting. And and along with Jim, I, I thoroughly enjoyed having the city solicitor stand next to me and say, you know, on this one occasion, the plaintiffs finally write, and we stand with them. So that was that was that was pretty thrilling. But you know, I'd like to take this moment to just give some concrete facts, if I could, about where we stand now. Is that okay, Kyle? Absolutely. The floor is yours. All right. So I I think about our progress and struggles with respect to gay rights in three columns. I got a plus column, I got a promising column, and I got a negative column. And of course, marriage equality is definitely a plus and one that we should always celebrate. And just this year in Ohio, we were one of three states where trans young people couldn't get their birth certificate corrected to the pr proper gender. And uh, that was changed in May of 21 in Ray versus McLeod, we finally implemented the fix on that. And that's a very exciting development finally. Of course, also in the plus column is that the city of Cincinnati is one of those cities where conversion therapy has been banned and that's important. Also just in 2020, the US Supreme Court interpreted Title VII to say that the ban on sex discrimination includes a ban on discrimination based on gender identity and gender and sexual orientation and expression. That was huge because that applies to every employer of 15 people or more. And then, of course, we knew that there was some real backsliding under number 45, but just this year, the DOJ has issued uh, an interpretation of Title IX saying that Title IX also bans discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation. So those are all pluses. We're making good progress. We should be proud of that. Promising, um, the Ohio Fairness Act, thanks to our good, great co-sponsor, Equality Ohio, picks up a new sponsor every time it gets introduced. Senate Bill 119, House Bill 208, more sponsors, more advocates. We hope to get that passed so that employers of four or more people uh, are covered and cannot discriminate based on gender identity or sexual orientation. And also with respect to bullying, uh, which is often a problem uh, for people in this community. Uh, we recently settled a case here in Cincinnati uh, against the Cincinnati Public Schools, where we've really helped reform the way bullying is identified and, and addressed and hopefully alleviated and I think that'll be a good step forward. Then we got a few real negatives. Uh, we have pending Senate Bill 132, House Bill 161. Those are the bills that ban trans uh, female athletes from participating in sports. I think that would violate Title IX. I know it would deny my own granddaughter the ability to participate in sports, so we don't want that to pass. And we have a loss that my firm participated in Merriweather versus Hartop. Uh, that was a case where the Shawnee State University disciplined a professor for refusing to use the pronouns that a student preferred. And the professor said, no, that's part of my academic freedom. I don't have to call that student by her preferred uh, pronoun. Um, we won at the district court level. The, the discipline was upheld. The Court of Appeals reversed, and now that's back in the district court for further factual development. So that's a law. So the full expression, the full embrace of gay people um, must still be fought. And we have plenty of work to do uh, in that regard. Thank you so much, Al. As Melissa Harris-Perry often says, the struggle continues. That's right. Uh, I want to turn now to Ron. And Ron, you are considered to be an elder um, of our community <laughs> and have seen and lived these changes and really the evolution that we've all witnessed here yeah. in our city. The queer community is known for having a habit of being notoriously ageist. Uh, and so we're curious to see if you've seen that trait manifest itself here um, in local LGBTQ circles. 
Well, uh, short answer to that would be yes. Um, but I've also noticed that not just since I've become an elder and I, and I really am kind of struggling with that word. Um, I have a 91 year old aunt, you know, she's an elder to me. Um, I'm 67. So I'm on the, I'm on the really young end of, of being an elder. Um, but I also have, well, yeah, I mean, cause my, I think most of the activities in our community really are geared towards younger people. Um, and I think a lot of the services that are created and a lot of the services that, that people uh, generate for whatever reason are geared towards younger people. And I think older people tend to get left out of the mix, you know, even just on the, the boards and organizations that I've worked with. You know, we've, I've, I've had this conversation several times in terms of when do you add older people? When I say older, meaning 55 and above, um, in terms of focus for treatment, because I think there's a, 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 a whole set of issues and a whole set of circumstances that I think get ignored. In particular, like when we talk about, you know, HIV, people who are my age now, um, you know, we were, we, I don't want to say we were the targets, but we were the, we were, we were that generation um, when HIV first hit Cincinnati. And so a lot of my friends have been HIV positive for, let's say, like 30 plus years now. Um, but they're also experiencing some issues just in terms of just having HIV for that this long term HIV survivor. So the impact of that with the medications, um, you know, people still are struggling with some of the um, um, negative ideas about HIV and being HIV positive. Um, and so you add age to that. And I think that creates a double bind for people. You know, I think that there are people, you know, when we talk about the homeless population, we talk about uh, people who have hunger issues, those types of things. We don't really ask questions, at least as far as I know. Now, again, you know, I've not been involved. I retired um, in um 2013 so it's been a while since i've been in, the, in working in the field but you know in terms of just that demographic do we know how many homeless uh elderly uh gay people there are looking at assisted care facilities nursing homes those types of things even with marriage equality a lot of those uh facilities um, are run by religious organizations and what kinds of, of problems and issues are couples going to have when somebody has to go into an assisted living facility or someone has to go into a nursing home, those types of things, you know, how do you celebrate those things? So I think there's a, there, and I think traditionally there just been a, a lack of attention paid to that end of the rainbow, just from a, from a cultural standpoint, because even just in, in general, we are youth oriented culture. Um, so you, and you put that into the, the LGBTQAI community, and that becomes even more of an issue because there are fewer services and fewer um, opportunities out there for um, older people. I was looking at a, a, an article with Artsway, for instance, um, and, you know, they have a lot of programs for youth and which is all great. But then, you know, you think about people such as myself, we, we've worked, you know, I worked for 30 years, I retired. You know, I was fortunate enough to go back to school and be able to get a photography degree. Um, but if someone has a desire to be an artist, for instance, or to start drawing or has that talent that they never really used, programs like that are geared towards young people as opposed to people who are 50 and older. You know, and I've seen lots of, of several, I won't say lots, I've seen several um programs where they partner the older generation with the younger generation um, and create programmings designed to help them connect. You know, I, I even said a couple times to some of the younger people, I had read a thing where you say, you know, you, you really are doing something wrong if you don't have a mentor who's 30 years old. Um, just because of, you know, the way things are. I mean, and I can work my way around most of the technology stuff, but I'm not that good at it and I need some help. And, you know, I, I've even said, you know, I, I, I could see a, if you've all have seen the movie, The Intern with, um, I guess it was Robert De Niro. So yeah, I would be all over that. It's like, 
I want to be an apprentice. I want to be an intern. I want to learn. Um, and I'm still waiting for that to, to um, blossom and to take place because I don't know that people really have a, I don't know that people are, are thinking that I'm serious about that, but I don't know that people really have that uh, a clue in terms of how do you, how do you make that connection between the generations? Uh, as a quick follow-up here, Ron, can you talk about the struggles faced by uh, individuals in the Black community who are also part of the gay community or the lesbian community um, that we may face that our white counterparts may not face? Well, well, there's discrimination within the gay and lesbian community or LGBTQAI community. Um, and, you know, and I think it's probably more, you know, I was talking or watching a clip the other day and someone was talking about people really reluctant to talk about race and racism. We'll talk about everything else, but we won't talk about race because it's so uncomfortable. But it's also a conversation that needs to be had because it is so prevalent. And because of the fact that it, well, number one, that it is so hard to talk about is exactly the reason why we need to talk about it. Um, but I'll give you an example. Um, if there were, um, it would be hard pressed, I think in Cincinnati to grasp that there actually are people of color who do things in the community because you don't see those people. You know, they're not the ones that are elevated. They're not the ones who are, are um, um, the stories are written about. Give you an example. Uh, how many people here have heard of, now as soon as I want to say the same, it's going to fall right out of my head, Felicia Barnes. You know, and Felicia Barnes was a Cincinnati police officer um, who transitioned um, while they were a police officer. They ended up getting, the, they were a, a patrol officer, then they got a desk job. And then eventually with the desk job, they got fired from that. Um, and she sued the city and she won. But when I tell people about Felicia, who was an African, who's African-American, um, people have never heard of her. Um, but they've heard of, you know, people who have get, gotten, you know, uh, streets named after them those types of things. But as far as, as people of color in the community and the, and the contributions, um, we typically are not, those things don't center on us. We're kind of like on, on the B list, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, and I think some of that is just being overlooked. I mean, when we get into the, I think uh, it said that the next series is going to be about, be about DEI, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but looking at our, our organizations and, you know, most of the boards still are run by um, cis white men um, and they're making the decisions about um, the, the organization and, and the population that the, that the organization's working with and, 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 and dealing with, but not necessarily looking at how do you make that more inclusive and more user friendly for people who, you know, don't necessarily um, look like you. Um, and I, I know I'm talking in very kind of vague terms, but I think that it, it just in general over, and I've lived here since what, 76. Um, so it, it's, 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 it's pretty constant. It's been pretty much of a pattern. Um, you know, you have microaggressions, you know, I I'm thinking of an example where one of the bars had a, a situation, um, where, um, uh, one of the um, um, patrons had talked about, you know, they felt like they were discriminated, discriminated against because of the color of their skin. Now, for me as, as, as a consumer and somebody who lives here, I was paying attention to how the person that owned this business was going to respond to that. And what you got was that, you know, that really didn't happen. Um, you know, I'm not racist. This is not a racist place. You know, just th that, that whole drive to kind of push it under the radar so that people don't react too badly to it or think negatively about it. But for me, I was looking to see how they were going to manage that. And, and in my mind, it might be one of those things where you don't believe that that was necessarily discriminatory in this particular case, but I can guarantee you that there are 10 other ones that there really were. 
And so being able to have that dialogue and being able to address those issues and, and, and to put something in place in your organization or in your, your um, place of business that um, establishes some protocols in terms of how you're going to deal with that and manage that when they do come up, as opposed to pretending like it, it just doesn't exist. You know, I, I think that's, that's, that's part of the, the dilemma here is we want to pretend like it doesn't exist, but it, it exists and, and, it, and, it's, it, and it's, it's quite um, more frequent than we realize that it is. Thank you so much, Ron. We will circle back uh, to all of our panelists, but I want to switch gears just for a moment and turn to Joshua, um, who's one of our younger panelists. And so Joshua, you seem to be part of the communities, I guess you can call it a metaphorical uh, passing of the torch as leadership shifts from one generation to the next. So how does that complicate the movement and also the responsibility of remembering our past and sharing that uh, with the generations behind us? So Joshua, if you want to answer that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that for me, uh, it's about learning what that history is um, and taking the time and being intentional about learning about that history. Uh, that it, it's always going to be, uh, as a part of a younger generation, it's always going to be a learning process for me because I, in all of the work that I do uh, going forward, I want to make sure that I'm giving respect to the people that came before me because I truly wouldn't be here uh, if it weren't for prominent members uh, of this community um, being um, vocal, being visible, doing the work that they've done. Um, I wouldn't be where I am doing the work that I'm doing without that. And so giving proper respect to that, learning where um, I may need to learn more uh, and be more intentional before um, doing some work, um, but then uh, really trying to do as much as I can where I may not know something or may not have the proper context for certain work, you know, making sure that I'm, in, uh, I'm not being the one that trying to drive that work, but being inclusive as much as I can with uh, members of the community to um, hand that off to someone and work with someone, I should say, I guess, um, that might be uh, better informed than I am because um, I think just building, for me, I'm really passionate about building community. And I think that because with how much has happened uh, leading us up to this point in history, um, that that wouldn't have happened had it not been for community. So I really, I think for me, respecting the history that's happened uh, also looks like me uh, trying to, as much as I can, bring the community together in different ways. and and finding those opportunities to uh, elevate the voices of people maybe um, that have felt left out or, and not a part of the discussion. Uh, Ron's talked about, um, about you know, the black community uh, often feeling left out of the, co of the conversation. Uh, I know that there's multiple parts of our community that, um, that feel that way. And you know, what can I do to help those people find their voice within our community because their voice is just as valid uh, in this work and it's just as important. Uh, and even now where we're kind of going into this next um, era, I guess you would say, um, is I think the primary work that's gonna be really important is starting to make, have this community look more representative um, of, of the community. Uh, Cause I don't think oftentimes it does look like that. I think oftentimes when people um, think of, of certain um, organizations and things like that that even serve our community, they, they have this image of their mind, in their minds of who that person is and who, that, who represents that, right? And, and the gay community, I think, has often been um, representative, uh, represented in people's minds um, by that kind of model, uh, if you would call it that, like white gay male, uh, you know, in our community. And uh, I know that, that that's very much not the case as a person that experiences disability and as a person that's a part of the AAPI community. You know, I know that I'm not, I don't, I'm not part of that. And I know so many uh, people in our vibrant community that, are, that don't have that identity, but uh, not to say that, um, that that identity isn't important. It absolutely is, right? Um, but there are so many other people that I think are going to be able to now get an opportunity and a, and a wonderful platform to be able to kind of uh, bring their communities and their intersections uh, into the limelight um, to be able to go ahead and have some of their needs addressed uh, and so that it's, it is more equitable equitable um, kind of across the whole community. Um, and I, I think that'll be a stronger place for us. How do we do that, right? How do we bring together 
um, th these different subsections within the gay community, not only here in Cincinnati, but I've lived in other cities where you run into the same issues. How do we make these organizations more inclusive of the entire gay community? I, I think it's, um, it's recognizing the reasons why people are, are kind of divided in their own kind of circles. It's hap those have happened because of the fact of very real and very um, concrete examples of marginalization, even within our own community. Um, I think giving respect to the, those traumas that have occurred uh, and then asking yourself, if you're truly invested in bridging those gaps, asking yourself, you know, how can I be the person that helps bridge those gaps? Um, you know, how can I help uh, a part of the community that's self marginalized feel more seen? Um, you know, addressing the trauma that they experienced, maybe getting some of the key players involved uh, that were the reason for that trauma, right? And then really having that conversation to say, you know, how, how do we go forward from here? Uh, and, and go together in community. Because I think the more that people see that, uh, I think the, um, the stronger that we'll be for it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I wanna turn now to David. And David, something that many LGBTQI people struggle with throughout their lifetime is the legacy of spiritual trauma and the impact that has on their overall well-being. So how are you and those involved in the reconciliation ministry helping those who have been hurt by the church to heal and to reconnect to spirituality. And I think a lot of people um, on this call can relate to this. So I'm really curious to see your answer. Uh, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank everyone that has already spoken. Um, it is inspiring um, every, every person, everything that's being added into the community through this conversation. Um, so in terms of um, how do faith communities that are trying to be about uh, the reconciliation work. Um, how do we address uh, the trauma that the church and other faith communities that represent, uh, how does that look, how does that happen? Well, I think the first thing that uh, faith communities try to do is, is we try to create and expand a welcome that's intersectional. Um, that is to, to say to persons, you bring your whole self here and you will be welcome here uh, with all of the intersections that make you up. Um, gender, race, sexual orientation, identity, uh, class, all of those things. So that's sort of the first place to begin. It often happens just with signs. It happens at websites um, that sort of say uh, you are welcome and mean it. Um, and then second thing is to that faith communities are called to listen compassionately, um, to listen deeply and to lean, and um, I lean a lot on mental health professionals, to really hear the trauma that others have experienced um, either by my own faith system, a Christian faith system, United Methodist faith system, or whatever faith system that has been a part of delivering that trauma and that spiritual harm into a person's life. So listening compassionately and leaning deeply uh, on other mental health professionals. Uh, Lighthouse House Youth Services is a great example of one. Um, then uh, third, um, faith communities can nurture, and it's one of the things that we're good at. We can nurture, we can organize large and small communities of affirmation, of growth, and for leadership development. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville, way back when this uh, revolution called the democracy in the United States was beginning, identified that was a unique quality in the United States was our ability to bring people together in small groups to, um, to be leaders, to be volunteers, to make a difference. And so that's what faith communities can do. We can um, forge those small communities where people are affirmed, where they can grow, and that magnify their gifts so they can become leaders. And that helps them recover from that trauma. <clears throat> and then um, finally, it's to, um, to offer blessing, to proclaim a message of blessing. Um, the church I serve, 59 Methodist, you know, we go to the Pride Parade every year and we take glitter and we walk on the sides of the parade as we go through it with glitter. And then we just say, would anyone like a glitter blessing? So instead of putting water on people and, and the number of teenagers 
who we encounter along that walk who say, yes, I want a blessing. All we do is sprinkle a little glitter over their head and just say, you are a beloved child of God. And we, and we trust that, that some of the hurt, some of the trauma can begin to, to be met with a blessing that says, you are good, you are loved, and, um, and God is the source of that, um, and there can be places where you can reside. Doing that also means that those faith communities have to then become public in their proclamation, in their outspoken proclamation, that the other messages of harm are, in fact, spiritual violence. And they must, must be stopped. So, so whether it comes out of one of our colleagues in the city, like at Crossroads occasionally, or maybe a closer neighbor, we have to call it out. We have to name it. We have to confront it. We have to help be a bit of a buffer for the most vulnerable and the most traumatized among us. So, um, and that's a, that's a persistent, relentless work that we have to be about. So those are a few ways that um, the congregation I serve and other reconciling and affirming communities use to try to help deal with the trauma that people experience uh, from faithful people and faithful uh, messages of faith that are corrupted. Listen, I will take a glitter blessing anytime you want to come over to the television. Okay. okay. You can come before the 11 o'clock news. Okay. Uh, we'll, be, we'll, be we'll be standing on the steps. I tell you, the people will line, they will line up to give you a glitter blessing. I don't know how my bosses will feel about me going on the air with glitter, but we'll deal with that later. Now, uh, now the people who won't take it are the parents of kids. They said, uh, don't you send that back into my house. Don't you dare. <laughs> I, I, you know, you talked about this, you're a Methodist minister, and you've been personally attacked over your sexuality. So how has that fight impacted your personal faith uh, and your personal relationship uh, with God? Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, let me dive in. Um, my name is David. So the first thing I learned as a kid was what that word meant. And that word meant beloved. And my grandmother called me love instead of calling me by my name. And those two things sort of set a tone deep in my heart about who I was. I remember going to Christmas Eve services. We'd light candles, you know, and then I'd try to carry that light home from a Christmas Eve service. And I, I can feel my hand around that candle just wanting to get that light all the way home. To the dark to the darkest places because i lived in you know in the 60s and 70s there's there's plenty plenty of negativity about my sexuality plenty of hate out there and i just carry that candle home um and then as a, a teenager and a young man you know i i discovered um that it was not about how faithful I was. It was not about how good I was. It was not about whether I was enough to prove that, that as a little gay kid, um, everybody should love me. But it was that I was loved. And it was an experience, I'm a Christian, it was an experience of how much God loved me that God sent God's son to love me, to let me know that. And, and it changed my life for the rest of my life. Um, but, but I struggled to um, live that in a very broken and divided world and felt sort of Jekyll and Hyde-ish most of the way. Um, and then uh, through good therapy and a good small group of friends, I began to discover an embodied faith, a faith that, was, that affirmed my love of another man. It affirmed me and who I was. And so, you know, I could be gay and I could be Christian. I could be married to Jim Schlachter and I could be called to a United Methodist ministry. I could be out and I could be proud about both of these things. And so when, when the church comes at me saying, you're not good enough, saying you've You've broken the rules, saying the man you love um, means that you can't be a minister anymore. Um, I am, instead of feeling hurt by that, although it does hurt, 
but instead of instead of feeling hurt by that, I feel pressed and called into service. I I feel for those who know the Old Testament, I feel like Esther in that moment. I feel in the moment when that comes at me that I am in this place for just such a time as this. It is my task to sort of say no to the evil in the world, to the injustice of the world, to the oppression that comes at me. And, and so I give it my best shot. I, I do it, I live it, and, and I hope I don't have to, to lose what has meant so, so much to me. But I will lose it for sure if I try to protect it. It's about just being it. It's the integrity of just authentically living it um, that actually is what um, makes all the difference in the world. And um, so that's how it's affected me. It's in fact strengthened my faith to be attacked. I think the only way to respond is amen. Uh, and to know that you have so many people who are supporting you and well, uh, walking alongside you. Thank you. I mean, this community has been incredible through the entire journey. Um, the community I serve at Clifton United Methodist Church, they've been spectacular. But just the many friends in this larger LGBTQIA community and just in the city of Cincinnati, um, I, I don't do it alone. Um, I stand on the strength of community and I really appreciate that. Well, they appreciate you, I am sure. Thank you. Uh, we are going to turn now to everyone's favorite Cincinnatian, I think, Mr. Ryan Messer. So Ryan, the next question is for you. Uh, last year, the Census Bureau estimated that 15% of LGBTQ couples in the US are raising approximately 300,000 children. And that's a 50% increase in the number of kids in same-sex households over the five years prior to that. You and your husband have four beautiful children, I love to see on Facebook. Um, and obviously for many Americans, the image of what makes a family has been changing drastically. So how have you been accepted in our community? Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I think it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight when you have kids, it drastically changes your life. I mean, I, I, I remember a time when I was a bit younger, pre-kids, Monday night would have been stop aids back in the day then evolving to caracol then tuesday was equality cincinnati and then wednesday i was doing hrc and then thursday we would have federal club events because we had to get a certain i mean it was every night of the week we just can't do that when you've got uh soccer and homework and all this stuff so that has been a, a major evolution um but as i've done that evolution it is unbelievable the number of same-sex couples that i've encountered across the city um, that you just, you didn't see because they were too doing things um, that were probably related to their kids and that type of thing. I think it was a benefit of having kids a little bit later in life. Um, we had a uh, Families Like Us event during Pride and we had 35 families and this was just scratching the surface. There's a Facebook group that we're kind of growing. Um, and, you know, I, I have to say that, the adoption of of us into the the world of the other families in the greater community has been kind of astonishing like we've never even gotten like that what um the only little thing a little girl said at school uh which i thought was pretty cute she said well who is that and olivier said that's my papa well who's that that's my daddy and she said oh that's no fair i don't even have a dad and i think that to me like the kids didn't care. Um, I'm a soccer coach. Uh, I became the most requested soccer coach because we had so much fun last time. And they said, hey, you had 23 families request. And I thought that was a pretty cool thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm in, in the North Avondale Fathers Group, North Avondale Montessori School Fathers Group. Um, very diverse. Um, you know, North Avondale Montessori, if you don't know, is probably, you know, according as for my school board work, it's the most representative of the demographics of our city in one school. It almost mirrors the demographics of Cincinnati's economically, racial, et cetera. Those, they have welcomed us with open arms. I'm one of the coordinators for the fathers group, very involved there. Again, not a single like, now what? So I think all the work that the people you see here, um, 
the work that's been done has, I, I don't even know how it happened so quickly because I remember as we were talking about, it was at the article 12. I mean, I had that lump in my throat, like I cannot believe they just voted against us. And then how many of my friends just left Cincinnati? And, you know, there's the Cincinnati chapter in San Diego, five friends that moved out there. When I go out, I get together with them, Atlanta, New York, but everybody left us. Um, and to see how fast we've gone, even they can't believe it. Uh, one in particular came in with a group of guys who used to live here from New York. And he's like, well, <laughs> are you sure you want to run for school board? And then I ended up getting the highest votes as a first time candidate for the school board. Nobody would have ever thought about a gay person being able to be involved in schools, let alone be on the school board for kids. So even they were like, now, how did that happen? Well, it's the people you see here who made that happen over the years. Uh, I, are you at least a little bit shocked that your transition into fatherhood hasn't been met with any obstacles or hurdles or, you know, looks that may be like, oh, what is this? Um, were you expecting that? Oh, I was fully expecting it. And you know, I'd heard the horror stories of people came before me that might have been in other cities and people that have maybe maybe were in the suburbs. Um, our children go to a gymnastics up on the north side of the city, and there's a, a female same-sex couple, and their experience is very different up in, you know, the nether regions up in there. Um, that's a little bit more red, you know, if you know what I mean, but... Um, you know, and I think, God, wow, how gutsy of you to live up there, frankly, just knowing the climate and things that we hear about these surrounding counties. But there's something very special. It, I just can't say that we've had a single issue like that. And, you know, the same sex couples we know, some are African-American, some are one African-American, one Caucasian. We happen to be both Caucasian. We have female and everybody kind of shares like it's really interesting. Neighbors have been so welcoming, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I, I have to say, I've been very surprised. Um, I thought that was still kind of an un, unknown. I mean, I knew we made great pr uh, progress in other places, but yeah. And, and then my last follow-up for you, what would be your advice to other gay couples who are considering, um, you know, having children? What would your advice be to them? I would say do it. You know, um, when we passed kind of the at Johnson & Johnson, I was able to work to get um, same-sex couples uh, paternity leave, whether they gave birth or not, whether it was adoption or not, um, to get parents to be treated like parents. And um, part of the argument there was, well, but, you know, to the head of HR, did you ever want to have kids? And she said, no, no, she's a heterosexual female. No, I don't have any. And I said, guess what? Some gay people are just like that. But guess what? Some straight people and some gay people also want to have kids. So if you are one of those that say, I'd like to have kids, um, you know, several of our friends have done uh, foster to adopt. I don't know, again, how we got so lucky. There is a judge who's, you know, a conservative Republican judge who might be one of the biggest advocates for same-sex adoption in the state of Ohio and beyond. And we're very lucky to have him here and he's helped several friends um, uh, through the process and getting children placed in. And so, you know, I think for the people here in Cincinnati, I absolutely believe that, uh, you know, if, if, if you have that in your heart to do it, there are so many kids who are needing, or if you decide to have children of your own, whatever your choice is, but um, being gay, lesbian, transgender, bi, you name it, uh, none of that should preclude you from, from uh, being a parent. Thank you, Ryan. And I think one of the reasons you guys have not encountered a whole lot of mess, I should say, is because you're so damn lovable, you and Jimmy both, okay? People love <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but we do, we do have a lot of fun as parents. And, um, and you know, I think the, 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 there is a group out there. I saw one of the chat pops up, pop up. Um, it's our transgender youth. Um, and I've had a lot of fun, frankly, as part of the school board to, to probably push us into being one of the most inclusive in the nation. Mm -hmm. um, up into including make, making sure that we have same-sex bathrooms, that our new buildings are fully equipped with gender neutral locker rooms, et cetera, things that have just happened and are non-discriminant. And then uh, the intense training we have for all staff, bus drivers and everybody of, of LGBTQ plus with specific training on transgender. Um, 
but you know, I think there are lots of transgender youth um, in that foster system that are desperately needing a home, just like all of our ki other kids. And, and I think if there was a, a wish or a hope, it's that we could elevate um, those children, awareness of those children through the system to get them into loving homes. And that's a perfect segue to Tristan, who we're going to speak with next. And Tristan, you're working regularly uh, with trans youths and young adults in our community as co-founder of Transform Cincy, um, which for those of you who are not familiar with that organization, uh, it provides young adults and teens with clothing uh, that aligns with their true selves. So it seems like the past couple of years, lawmakers nationwide have turned their attention away from attacking the overall LGBTQ community and centering their attacks on trans individuals, especially children. So what impacts have you seen these attacks have on our kids that you've been working uh, with locally? And Ryan had mentioned this, we had someone in the chat who said um, they're excited to hear about the success stories of, you know, gay individuals, but they're concerned about our trans youth in the community. Yeah, um, I love that everyone, this group is amazing. I'm, I'm still in awe that I'm, I'm part of it. So um, thank you, Ron, David, everyone that went before. Um, I have the same concern. We talked about how it's youth driven in the LGBTQ community. And a lot of times I have to separate and go LGBTQ plus and trans and trans youth are a little bit different. And we still have to recognize that we're losing our rights, that we don't have spaces, that we're not seen, that we're often not invited to the table. Um, I'm still surprised when I'm invited to the table to actually have a conversation or be a part of it. And I'm in 32 school districts doing training I'm in several law offices, hospitals, I work with medical professionals in my consulting business, along with Transform. There are some success stories. Uh, these kids are resilient and amazing. And there are other mentors and individuals and role models out there that they see. I love that Transform Cincy exists because we often focus on medical transition, the legal transition, things like that kids need. That's a very tiny piece. They need the social transition, they need community, they need spaces where they feel safe and they need people that look like them. Uh, and oftentimes they don't see that. They don't see that with their parents. They don't see that in the gay community because we still really are very cisgender white focused in the community and trans does get left behind. A lot of times I, I heard in our, in our thoughts on how we gear our community and where the money goes towards, we've been told, oh, uh, trans black women, we'll come back for you. Trans folks, we'll come back to you. Um, we'll get back to that. We got to make sure we get rights for those who, who look normative and who will fit in and assimilate. And so these kids see this. They feel this. They understand this. And so these spaces are very important. And have elders to come back and bridge some of those gaps. Like I'm already going to reach out to Ron because I, I really want to have you come speak to some of these kids. They need this. I don't consider you an elder, though. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you're kind of in that in between space. Um, but yeah, I, I'm concerned too, but there are lots of people out there doing this work. Um, I've been on several panels with Joshua and I know that he's out there trying to do this work and sees it and wants to, to bridge people together. Um, I'm very hopeful. Um, I heard him say, you know, it's just us talking and getting together and, and reconciling some of those hurts that we have within our own community. Um, and I've become a little cynical uh, as I age. I'm now 43. I'm kind of that bridge between elders and this, this younger generation, and I'm ready to hand over the torch and retire as well. But what I, what I see is, is I'm, I'm keeping my head down and doing my work because I'm not seeing a lot of reconciliation. Um, and so I'm trying to see the biggest needs out there. Our biggest needs are our trans black women that are out here and our youth that are out here. And that's why we try to serve and stay where we're at for Transform. Uh, something that I run into a lot at work and in the community is just there's a lack of education and more so awareness. Like we had a conversation today at work as to why we're saying pregnant people as opposed to saying pregnant women um, and misgendering. And I feel like people are well intentioned, but they just don't understand it. What can we do more to help people understand these issues on a level where we meet them where they are? I think some of it is making sure that we bring people to the table that can actually speak to this. So often I'm in rooms where, or panels, and that's not the case with this one, I'm very impressed with it, where we're pulling in people because they have that identity. And they're like, oh, you, we've ticked off all the boxes on the identity so you can speak to this entire group. And I'm like, there's no theory behind it. There's no history behind it. There's no work behind it. You've picked someone because they identify as such. And this is the voice that we're gonna have. And I think we, we make a mistake in that and we make a mistake in, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hire someone who's an electrician and be like, oh, you, you look like you can handle some wires, but we put individuals in front of others to teach us when they might ha have those skills. Does that kind of make sense? I see it so often in, 
And it's one thing that I really push back on as often as I can, pay people for their time, pay people for their education that they're giving you and make sure that their CV, their resume and what they do is such that, that you're getting the education that you need because oftentimes that's where we make a big mistake. Uh, you were part of Evan Millward's pride special that he did at WCPO. And I thought that you explained because a lot of people are confused or they don't understand pronouns. And I feel like the way that you went through it uh, and really explained it to people was so beneficial. I don't work there, obviously, but I can recognize good journalism, even if it doesn't come from my organization. But we need to see that more often. You know, you put it in a way that anyone who may have had a question could watch that um, and say, OK, this makes sense to me. And when I use humor to disarm people, um, as you saw, probably there, you know, uh, Krista was asking me, well, I'm a straight woman. And I'm like, are you a straight woman? You know, just kind of <laughs> disarming her for a second. And then being like, we all use they, them in the singular. Y'all have been using it since before the 1700s. And people are intelligent. We understand context with language. Um, you know, if, if you and I were in a room and someone left a set of keys, we're going to be like, oh, they're going to be back for those keys. They're not going to get very far without those keys. They're going to need those keys to drive their car. It's one person coming back. We use it in the singular all the time, but our, our mindset, we get fixed in that piece of it's singular. And there's a stigma around trans people who don't transition completely. There's still a stigma around someone who, like myself, is genderqueer or non-binary, and we want to put them in a box. I've been told many times, I worked for IUPUI, I opened their LGBTQ plus center, so I remember you from Indianapolis, I was there at the same time. And I was told when I started there, can you just go by he or she because it's much easier. I can't deal with this they, them, non-binary stuff. And this was from a lesbian within that organization that told me this. So even with our own community, there's a lot of stuff that we're still up against. A lot of this youth are up against that. So please don't pick up and go, oh, you're a gay cisgender uh, affluent white male. You can understand the, 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 um, the journey of a trans kid. No, you can't. <laughs> so why do we keep picking those people to speak for trans youth? Uh, and last question for you. I could talk to all of you all day. This is so hard to keep going. Um, why do you think people have honed in on trans youth the last year or so? Here in Cincinnati? Uh, just across uh, the country. You know? I, think, I think across the country, uh, it's, it's kind of one of those spaces where we've had some visibility. But I will say Cincinnati is becoming a hub. You've got Cincinnati Children's Hospital that's been doing this work for about 15 years and they're starting to get that traction. Um, it's always said, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Well, we got a call from someone in New York wanting to start a transform there. I said, if you can make it in Cincinnati, you can make it anywhere. If you can deal with the tension of the Midwest and Cincinnati in particular being like, what do we say? It's the most Northern Southern city. If, if you can, right? If you can do that, then you can make it anywhere. So if we can, we can push trans rights for youth here. And especially when we look at that intersectionality, trans black youth, who adding all these other identities, if we can encompass that here, then we can do it everywhere else. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for your work and all that you are doing uh, for all of the communities here. Uh, Sarah, I want to turn to you now, uh, because we know one of the classic intersections in popular culture with the LGBTQ community has always been the arts community. So the visual arts, as well as the performing arts have often been seen um, as refuge for queer creatives. So could you speak to how that has manifested itself here in Cincinnati and really more broadly across the Midwest, Stephen? Sure, so when I became a part of the LGBTQ community, which was about 20 some plus years ago, it was about the same time that I started getting involved in the arts in Cincinnati, started getting on arts boards and committees and whatnot. And you know, at that time, I mean, we talked about this earlier, Article 12 was on the books and um, you know, that was, just a crazy time. And uh, in 2004, it was repealed. So that was great. Um, I can tell you during that time, I remember my, my wife's parents being really fearful that she uh, would be fired from her job in advertising because, you know, we were out. And as I was getting on boards, we were out as a couple. We were always listed as a couple. I didn't think anything of it. Um, and it always seemed like the arts were a community where you felt like you had a family and it felt like like very personal and very cool. Um, but I can tell you when I got on the art museum board um, at that time, I was the youngest um, member at the time. And I was probably... I know I was the only one that ever has been out on the board and I maybe could have been the only one at the time that was part of the LGBTQ community, but um, I felt, um, I don't know, I just felt 
being on the arts community board, you know, that was part of an old staunchy arts organization. It was the museum. It wasn't as vibrant as the Contemporary Arts Center at the time. And it wasn't as accepting. But then in 2008, the art museum, you know, did something pretty incredible, I thought. They hired Aaron Betsky, who uh, at that time was uh, was gay and married to his husband, Peter, and to be the director. And I thought, you know, this time, this is 2008, so things are starting to finally come around the arts community. I'm seeing a positive spin, you know, because the art museum has is, is embraced this. Uh, and then for me, it went kind of dormant for a while as far as the arts and, and the, gay, you know, the gay population, because it wasn't until um, 2017 when Arts Wave uh, started uh, a pride committee. And as most of you know, Arts Wave is the organization in Cincinnati that raises millions and millions of dollars every year for arts organizations all across the, the Cincinnati area. And in 17, they started this pride committee, which I was a part of, which was, you know, awesome. And I thought, hey, here, you know, arts are starting just again, you know, coming to come into the program. And then in 2018, um, they started a pride grant program, which gave money to anyone in the arts community that was doing, creating programming specifically to the LGBTQ community. So Kyle, it seems like over the years we have, we have gotten someplace, you know, in 2004, when, when the 12 was, article 12 was appealed, you know, it was one thing, you know, we've come a long way in some respects in the arts community, but in my opinion, we still have a long way to go. I was going to say, can you talk about those gaps and where we need to improve specifically when it comes to the arts community here in Cincinnati? Because we all talk about how vibrant our community is when it comes to art. We talk about the murals, we talk about the productions we get at the Aronoff Music Hall. But if there are those gaps, what are they and how can we address those? Well, it takes, it takes a village. I mean, it takes a lot of people, you know, like me, like everyone on this panel who's speaking up and speaking out um, to really make make progress. And, you know, I feel, you know, this panel is so impressive. I feel like, oh my God, I'm just talking about the arts community here right now. But, um, you know, I think it's up to all of us to um, speak up. And um, again, you know, it takes all of us. And I, you know, we've, we've come a long way, um, but like I said, we have a long way to go. And, and I see things, you know, in the Midwest, you know, things are starting to come up a little bit more in the arts community on some things I'm a part of there. But again, you know, it's like everything else, it, you know, it takes time and, um, you know, we still have a long way to go. But I feel like we've come a long way from 2004 to where we are now in the arts community. But, you know, I hope to see it prosper and do more as, you know, as the young people come up and younger people are getting involved in, in the organizations and they have a voice to help. You know, as we've seen greater public acceptance of the LGBTQ community, um, what impact do you think that has had on the art that queer artists are producing right now? Well, repeat that question again, Kyle. You know, as we've seen broader acceptance of the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community, has yeah. that had an impact on the art um, that queer artists are producing across the country? Um, in some respects, I think, yes, I do see a lot of um, organizations and arts organizations that I'm a part of uh, acquiring more art by the LBGTQ committee, which is awesome. I think that's great. We have, there's so many amazing, amazing LGBTQ artists out there. And I know I constantly as an art collector, you know, typically collect art by women and artists of color, but I'm, I'm just always amazed at um, just how many amazing artists we have in that community. And slowly but surely, museums are starting to acquire work by, by that, that community. And, you know, it's, it's, it takes time, but um, it's, it's, you know, it's starting to prosper a little bit in that field. And I, I just feel that as time comes on, you know, more and more organizations are going to be more accepting of art by the LGBTQ artists. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the work that you're doing in our community, especially um, in the areas of arts and entertainment for so many people here in Cincinnati. Um, so that comes to a conclusion for the prepared questions that we had, but we are going um, to take some Q&A questions from our Q&A um, time for people who are tuning in tonight. And we have one already from Amy, um, and this will be open to anyone on the panel who wants to 
take this question. It says, the population that I work with is people with developmental and or physical disabilities in the city of Columbus. Can anyone speak about how the treatment of this population has changed in the LGBTQ plus community of Cincinnati? The agency that I work with often serves transition aged youth and many of them struggle with gender identity and other things. Many of them live and rely on the care of unaccepting families. So does anyone feel comfortable addressing that question? Looks um, like Joshua I, was raising his hand. I can go ahead and start. Um, I would say that um, the disability community is one that's largely uh, have, has been ignored and not a, been a part of the conversation for, you know, whether it is the LGBTQ community or not, um, which I find kind of fascinating. Uh, if you think about it, uh, people with disabilities here in the, the United States, 26% uh, of us will experience disability as adults. Uh, worldwide, that's 15%. And so with such a prevalence of people with disabilities um, in the world, uh, why are we not seeing more and more of us? Uh, in the community. And I think it's because we live in such an able normative uh, society, unfortunately. And I, and I would love to say that uh, I feel like uh, it's gotten better here in the Cincinnati community. I don't necessarily believe that to be so, but it is an area that I am, I'm personally trying to um, make sure that it, that it changes, you know, so the people with disabilities can be more part of the community. Because I think the larger part of this conversation about changing the tide and all this work that we're doing about making sure that we have equal rights uh, and and visibility um, across the spectrum is is this mindset that we eventually want to use that as a platform to change and shift the mind the cultural mindset to a a, a world. Uh, I think about uh, this is a tangent, but I think about the the movie Love Simon and talks about why is straight the default and this world about, uh, that we might be able to one day live in where we don't have to worry about coming out. Right? We can just talk about, hey, you know, I I love, you know, I, I kind of like this one guy at, at school, uh, and you know, and it doesn't have to be this huge laborious process of coming out. I, I just recently got an opportunity a couple of weeks ago talking about my coming out experience and how as a person that lives at the intersection of API disability and, and queerness that I actually came out as gay uh, last. And then I ended up coming out as, as a proud Asian and then a proud person with a disability before I came out as a person that, that was proud of being gay. Um, and it's because of the fact that for the longest time I didn't see myself in the community. I didn't, it was 2016 before I saw the, uh, the TV show uh, uh, Speechless. Uh, it was 2017 before I saw a typical on Netflix, and on Netflix, and those were the first times. And I was before, uh, after I was turned 30 that I first saw myself in any kind of positive, non um, kind of uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, satirical kind of light uh, when it comes to my my disability. Um, and but then it wasn't until 2019 uh, when um, Ryan O'Connell special uh, Netflix special called special that I first saw myself at all as a person, a queer person with a disability. And it's because I think about back to um, when I was younger, Saved by the Bell, I had this episode where Zach uh, Morris ended up um, befriending this person on this, um, this, this hotline of some sort. And he went and he like ends up kind of being, you know, being attracted to her and, and wants to go on a date with her. And then it was until he goes on this date in person that he realizes that she has a disability. And even that episode, as important as it was for me to maybe see that episode when I was younger, um, it's still very, very much centered itself on the perspective of the person that didn't experience disability and really didn't do, do a good job, in my opinion, of talking about the perspective of the person that was othered in that situation where Zach Morris ends up being this this douchey guy, and there's this really great uh, YouTube special. It says, I think it's called Zach Morris is a douchebag or something like that. But it's this whole idea where Zach Morris creates this whole huge like benefit, um, and it's a wheelchair uh, basketball um, benefit uh, for this hotline that they do. Um, but then like this whole thing, and then like they have this really great game, and then like he like calls her out in the end of the game, like, hey, and this is for this person that that you know it's the only person that actually has to be in a wheelchair and, and and it's just so cringy and it's i think uh, to answer this question in a very roundabout way sorry but uh, i think that what's going to be more important now is is this idea that we've been talking about kind of throughout uh, all, all of these conversations is about more visibility and how visibility is so important we talked about in the chat about how it's going to be so important and to not take for granted 
what you're taking space means in, in, to other people's lives, right? And so um, I very, very much respect and, and am humbled by the idea that me getting any kind of platform uh, as a person with a disability might help someone else in my community who experiences disability, who's queer, um, feel more empowered, feel like their world is maybe a little bit more expanded. And then, you know, me having the responsibility and me taking the responsibility on because I want to and feel that it's important to be able to say, okay, well here, this is how the world that you want to enter or that you're about to enter into is not ready for you. But I want to be able to to gather some people around. And that's why community engagement is so important for me is that I want to gather some people around so that when it's time for you to come into this world as you are, whoever you are, uh, that the world is ready for you. Because right now, I will be honest, uh, even here in Cincinnati, the world isn't ready for people, queer people with disabilities. I remember going to Blink um, a couple of years ago and um, I was walking around with some friends and this woman very, very vocally said, why in the world is he out here uh, in public uh, with the disability? Like, he, doesn't he know is this place isn't, isn't for him? Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And I can remember that someone saying very vocally uh, next to me and said, why is this person here? He has no business being here. And so, you know, that, that until that mind shift and that we can get enough people uh, around us that says, you know, no, you do belong here. And I'm sorry that this is in inaccessible for you, but let's see what we can do to kind of dismantle those barriers. Uh, and I would, whoever you are, I would love to work with you and I would love to to see what we can do both in Cincinnati and in Columbus, because uh, I'm really excited about the work that, that we can do um, to create a better world for people with disabilities, for sure. So well, yeah. let me also uh, jump in, Kyle, if I could, because Joshua actually raised one of two ways in which these uh, developments happen. He's referencing a lot of uh, media exposure that lifts up uh, people that, that need to be seen and heard and, and accepted. And of course, I'm suing people in order to uh, secure some rights so that they can be seen and heard and then embraced. And, and I've, I've added the ADA claim whenever I can to like police misconduct cases, to employment cases, uh, so that we can uh, try to make sure that those who have disabilities have their legal rights firmly established. And once you have to deal with them, as our lawsuits <clears throat> established that you had to deal with queer people, that you had to deal with black people, that then uh, it's just one uh, piece of the puzzle that we have to build in order for people to be fully accepted. Uh, this is such an exciting panel in part because if I were doing this uh, 20 years ago, it'd be mainly lawyers, you know, talking about who we're suing and what little progress we made. And now I'm just a little cog in this because you're all living it and you're all taking it to the next level. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I think that's a great point too, because I think that right now, especially when it comes to the ADA, that a lot of businesses and a lot of organizations use the ADA as kind of like a very low, like, baseline kind of oh uh, let's and, but then even as as basic as the ADA is uh, for improving the lives of people with disabilities people I can't tell you how many organizations and businesses have used the ADA almost as like a challenge to themselves to say okay well here's how I can kind of skirt this rule or here's how I can kind of get around this rule oh I'm sorry it's technically infeasible I'm sorry we can't do it Oh, I'm sorry that this will destroy the beauty of this historical landmark. We can't do it because then it would ruin the history. I tell people all the time, I don't care how rich and vibrant the history of a building is. If I can't physically access the space, it means nothing to me. And so I think that that's so important uh, that you're talking about there, Alba, about making sure that hold, holding people to task to the ADA and, and that it's not a, a reason to to skirt around something. It's the reason to be inclusive, right? It's a reason for people to be able to be seen because it is important. And I think that it, it advances society forward when we are able to actually be inclusive, right? And Josh, I believe in a call to action and like giving people tangible things that they can do to improve upon these issues. So if there's one, maybe two things that you could say to the people on this panel that we can then take to people in our daily lives, how can we make Cincinnati a more welcoming, inclusive place 
uh, for LGBTQ folks who are living with disabilities? I think that for myself, when it comes to my experience and what, what helps is just people, you know, maybe it's just this exercise, you know, think about your most common route to work or the, maybe your most um, enjoyable, um, maybe um, walking trip or path and think about that path in and of itself. Are there stairs? Um, if it's rainy, what happens, you know, in that kind of a situation and really thinking about those situations and then figuring out, is there a way that I can make that different, uh, that experience different for someone else? Uh, a big battle that I'm about to enter into is, is, um, is inaccessibility and historic preservation myself. Uh, and this idea that um, I've never, I've experienced a lot of in, uh, in issues with inaccessibility, but more so when it comes to historic, uh, historic sites. And so, um, you know, really just, um, paying attention to that and really you know if you do have the opportunity and the uh, privilege of being in spaces that make decisions when it comes to building permits or 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 you know zoning and, and things like that or decisions when it comes to uh historic preservation and and renovations and things like that if you have the ability to advocate for me when i'm not in those spaces physically uh i, I would greatly greatly appreciate it and i know that uh, I have a very huge family, 18 brothers and sisters, uh, a bunch of us experience disability. And I know that not only myself, but a bunch of them would also appreciate it. It's just really advocating for me uh, when I'm not around. It's going to be super, super important. I think you have a lot of new friends on this Zoom tonight who are going to be advocating on your behalf moving forward. Uh, um, Al, I'm curious, are, are there any cases that you have in the pipeline that you can speak to now? Um, as we were talking about earlier, trans youth have been uh, the focus of a lot of bands when it comes to sports. And, and for years, we've been talking about bathrooms. Is there anything that you're working on currently dealing with either of those issues? Uh, no, I'm not personally litigating any trans issues at this moment. Uh, but I have represented uh, trans inmates who have uh, many problems in, in jails and prisons. I've represented trans employees. I represented Felicia Barnes in the case that uh, was dis uh, discussed earlier. And, you know, it's so important that their legal rights be firmly established so that we can build on that, as I mentioned earlier. And I think um, while they're currently a disproportionate uh, target for right-wing politicians, uh, we are making steady progress on trans legal rights. And there isn't a, a legally identifiable line between the rights of trans people and the rights of other human beings. There, you know, this is all made up. And so a lot of the legal precedent, uh, and you saw this uh, in Bostick, and you saw this in some of the cases that have already come down. So I'm hopeful that as the courts lay out the law, and make it clear that there is no uh, defensible distinction between trans people and other people, that this new wedge issue will fade away and then we can lift people up the way they ought to be and embrace them appropriately. Ryan, do you have any data on the number of trans individuals that we're seeing at CPS? And can you talk about the work that you guys are doing um, to make these young people feel included, loved, and embraced on a daily basis at school? Yeah, um, I probably wouldn't do it justice to, to try to explain it fully. Um, but, you know, we've signed up, um, as, you know, I would say in the, it, kind of there's a, a, a scoring system, et cetera, that we're kind of in that top 5% of progressive school boards who've not only um, added non-discriminatory and all, all, all the, the appropriate language to uh, district policies, but we've uh, made the commitment that every single person that interacts with our children will have gone through that in-depth training and that, you know, all of our policies have been reviewed so that, um, you know, if adjustments need to be made uh, just to get the language correct that that's been done. Um, uh, trying to think of the, uh, the city came to us. It was Chris Silbach. Obviously, it helps to have people in, in our community and supporters in different spots. But he came to me with an organization that was really best in class. And um, we began those conversations. And that partnership started this school year um, to double down on um, 
making sure that we provide very specific and, and focused um, connections with those children as well as the wraparound services for them and their families. Uh, because it's not anything that really the, the school district was experienced in being able to do. We had to find partners like we do for a lot of things. Um, oh, gosh. Justin, you might be able to help me with this one. <laughs> but it was it was a joint effort between um, Chris and myself and bringing the city and the school district together uh, with this organization. I cannot speak to the percentage. Um, but what I will say is I was invited to um, a parent support group through my friendships with the team there at Children's who are running a world-class clinic there. Um, and they invited me in the, you know, it was clear that our district was light years ahead. They were just working through some just basic equal treatment, equal and fair treatment of their children in their school, which is just unfathomable to me. Um, so I don't exactly have the numbers, uh, but I can tell you that we are investing heavily uh, to be seen as the best school district in Ohio and across the country for children uh, who are transgender. I'll help you out here, Ryan. <laughs> um, help me out. Yes, you're right. Um, the language you crafted for the non-discrimination was amazing. I kind of helped with that language. Chris was amazing for getting them in front of there. It changed it and made sure it was good. Um, and your, your district is amazing as far as being light years ahead. There's always work to do. I've worked with Meg Burroughs on some bullying issues, um, trying to address those within specific schools. They're really great about identifying which schools we need to get into and kind of look to. What's fascinating about CPS, they're doing the right thing. It's on paper, it's policies. They're so large that kind of individual schools sometimes feel like they can take on their own thing. So I get calls from principals who are like, hey, we can't let this student use this bathroom. Like, actually, Title IX. So I'm texting Daniel Hoying, who's their legal counsel there. Like, <laughs> hey, Daniel, we got another school. And by the way, high school diplomas are not legal documents. You can put your chosen authentic name on it. So working with that, then I work with Launch Ed, who used to be the Mayerson Academy, Kevin Rosebook, um, offering workshops on LGBTQ, focusing on trans and all the way through doing cohorts for all teachers, administration, and anyone like that. So doing great work, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think it, it is, I think it's a, um, it's a good place and I'm rolling off the board this year. I mean, the COVID, COVID school board world, family, career, all that was a little bit much. However, um, what I'll say is, yeah, I'm the only openly gay person, part of this community represented here that's on the board. But anytime something's come up, it is 100% supportive. I see that in our administration. I think hopefully, Tristan, you can say our legal counsel. He's probably the most supportive. He's I, amazing. I use um, you all. I use you all de-identified for other districts. Yeah. So I'm like, here's the memo that was that was come, that they came up with, and here are some of the policies. I de-identify the information, but then you're the template for the other 31 districts that I'm in. So kudos to you all for. And well, kudos for you for helping make that possible for these children, because again, the the district can't do it alone. Um, we need the subject matter experts to guide and coach. And what I can say is I'm very happy that CPS is aware of their limitations and the need for the partners. And point well taken, uh, with greater than 63 schools throughout the city, many of those do operate in these, you know, they, they generally tie to CPS and then all politics are local. So it's a school by school effort. Um, but I do feel really good that um, the climate in Cincinnati is also kind of transitioned into our schools as well. Uh, another question that we have here is what are the biggest challenges Cincinnati's LGBTQIA residents are facing going forward? And I know that's a loaded question, um, but I'll open that up to anyone on the panel um, who maybe has not had an opportunity um, that I didn't have an opportunity to circle back with tonight, but open to anyone at this point. Anybody? Um, I would say probably looking at um, organizations and looking at the issues of equity and inclusion um, and having those difficult conversations around marginalized populations, you know, in terms of whether it's people of color, whether it's disabilities, whether it's, it's trans, whether it's elderly, you know, the list goes on and on and on. I think that that's going to be very key for us to be able to, um, number one, stay in that, you know, top 100 index. Um, 
but also I think for people to feel safe and people to feel welcome and included um, in the community, because I think that's, that's, that's really going to be key moving forward because we have to, uh, it's important that we work together as a community, but we also have to acknowledge the people in the community that haven't been invited to the table before, um, unless there was a, um, how do I describe this? Um, well, basically tokenism, you know, people come to the table, look, we have this person, it, so you can back off and leave us alone. They don't really change policies, but you know we have the the the, the physical representation. We 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 take good um, um, pictures in terms of what we look like. But then when you scratch beneath the surface, the policies and 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 the plans to be able to even move forward to include people other than the um, advertisements, they're just not there. So I think that's going to be one of the bigger ones. Um, to look at as we move forward as a community. Tristan, were you about to say something? Or, oh, okay. Uh, I want to make sure that no one else who is joining us tonight on the Zoom has any questions. Um, if not, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know we were going to be here till nine o'clock, so I want to make sure uh, that we do end on time. I also have to get back to work to do the eleven o'clock newscast, which I hope I will be watching you tonight. Uh, but if not, I will turn it back over to Dwayne um, and I will let you have the last word. But I do want to say thank you to this incredible panel um, and thank you to everyone who is attending tonight. I wish I could see your faces and I wish we could do this um, in person, but hopefully as long as more people continue to get vaccinated, um, maybe some of our spring or summer events will be able to hold in person and we can all be together once and again. Kyle, can I add one thing? Absolutely. You said things that, you know, to concern about for the future in Cincinnati. I think it's that we get, we've made so much progress that we're kind of feeling really good. <clears throat> and, you know, and I think some of the people who took the reins for some of the organizations I was a part of, some of them have said, gosh, we're just not getting turnouts like we used to. People just aren't excited. Well, it feels pretty good right now. And then I read uh, the, the story that the state of Ohio Physicians can now deny treatment based on their sexual orientation, gender identity. You know, th th so we can't get too comfortable in, in this little microcosm that we're in, or we're going to lose everything because it is incumbent upon us to also do our part at the, the state and at the federal level. So that's the only concern that I have is, you know, this, this comfort that we are experiencing here, A, is not the same place everywhere and it's not guaranteed so that's the only thing i would add and i think part of that is because people who are my age and younger we walked into a society that was much more welcoming right we don't know the fight that you and so many others on this call um went through and what you all had to fight for and so i think it's important for events like this they remind us of what people went through uh before we came along and that you all you know blazed this trail to make what we're doing today possible and, and you really need to heed uh, Ryan's words, because in the past, when an outrageous law would be passed that would say that a doctor could choose not to serve somebody because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity, you'd go to a lawyer and say, sue them, and you'd hope to win. Well, the courts are turning to a, to a place where we may not be able to win even obvious cases. <laughs> so... Uh, having public support for justice, for having, a, for having equality be normative uh, is very, very important. And that takes everyone's uh, chipping in and, and believing and working together and not just waiting for lawyers to do it. Well, I want to take an opportunity to thank Kyle for his uh, wonderful moderating tonight. Uh, we appreciate his uh, stepping in and helping us with this, we appreciate all of our panelists for donating their time uh, to discuss uh, these very important topics to our community. Um, in closing, I would like to say that uh, it's almost been a case of deja vu these last couple of years, I think, that uh, looking back at the history of Cincinnati and then what we've experienced the last couple of years with uh, an awakening uh, over police brutality, uh, in light of the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor killings and the resulting protests, 
we were back with a referendum vote uh, just a, about a year ago in the village of Gough Manor, where residents were trying to thankfully unsuccessfully this time rescind an LGBTQ inclusive human rights ordinance, legislative attacks on the LGBTQ community. Uh, so it seems history always finds a way to repeat itself in some manner. Um, but we're all still there working together, hopefully, fighting the fight. And uh, it's our hope that those of us who are involved in these issues can move past uh, any type of simply performative allyship and truly address the intersectional marginalization that we see throughout our communities. And we hope that we have at least taken a first step to open some of those conversations up tonight. And we thank you for uh, helping open those doors. And uh, hope that uh, you all continue the good work in our community. And uh, we welcome you to uh, continue working with Community Shares and the charities that we work with uh, in any way uh, that you see fit uh, to help further equity and justice in our community, uh, beyond just the LGBTQ community, but throughout all residents of our communities. And uh, we uh, invite everyone who's watching to come back in January when we have our next uh, in this series of discussions. And thank you all again uh, for your time and your energy and your dedication to our community. Thank Good you for having so us. Much. Thank you.